So let's go ahead and get through these and see what happens. Okay, this one says, uh, could you recite the chant that begins, may I, may I abide in well-being in freedom from hostility and ends so above and below unto all is to myself, um, as well as the chant that goes, may I abide uh, with one quarter imbued with loving kindness, likewise the second, likewise the third. I'm getting these confused in my head. Uh, so these days I don't really have any chanting in English memorized. Um, uh, I can still recite a fair number of things in Pali, um, but yeah, I find any translation is mm, insufficient. Um, translations are always approximations. Um, so since I know Pali, it doesn't really make sense for me to memorize translations of things. Um, so I would just recommend that after the retreat uh, that you look up on the internet these two chants and find some translations that you like and memorize them in those translations. This one says, are you aware of the website bigwords.com? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's a book shopping search engine. If you're willing to wait longer for your books to arrive, it's a lot cheaper than Amazon. Um, it doesn't allow lay supporters to donate at the same time using Amazon Smile, but 0.5% isn't very much. It's true, Amazon Smile is a joke. It's really not much at all. <laughs> I calculate Buddhist Insights supporters would have to purchase one million dollars in goods a month <laughs> just for BI's rent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to check your math on that, but yeah, it's true. Amazon Smile is it's pennies. It hardly amounts to anything. No, the main, the main thing about Amazon is that it has an integrated public wish list, which is quite convenient. Um, yeah, otherwise I don't necessarily recommend using Amazon. It's, sometimes you can find good deals, sometimes you can't. Um. <laughs> Maybe I should just talk about Buddhism. <laughs> One says, Dear Bunte, let's talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I know monks are celibate, but the precept for lay people is so broad. I have this friend, we'll call her Sally. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> is this the same as Sally from Accounting? <laughs> relationship she has always involves one person wanting to have sex more than the other. <coughs> I'm sure this is common, uh, but how to wisely respond? Any advice from you or the Buddha other than to be celibate? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I do have to say that celibacy does clear up these issues quite thoroughly and completely. <laughs> um, that said, if Sally is not yet willing to be celibate, which is not surprising, most people are not interested in celibacy. So I, I understand. Um, then uh, the thing in that situation is that both people in the relationship need to be kind, considerate, and respectful of each other. Um, so 
that may mean making some compromises. It may mean being willing to uh, either, uh, yeah, it may, it may be, you have to make some sacrifices in a relationship. Um, so I'm not saying the sacrifices should, should be on the side of the person who wants more or the person who wants less, but rather it's that both people need to be kind to each other. Um, if your relationship is not loving, then it's not worth much of anything. Um, so one thing, uh, so it, it is true. So the, the Buddha is pretty clear that um, sexual activity strengthens desire and attachment. Um, and so therefore it's, it's, not, it's not on the side of the wholesome for the most part. Um, it's, uh, it tends to strengthen our ties to samsara and therefore strengthens our dukkha, strengthens our suffering. Um, but if you're in a loving relationship, then you can also, that relationship can also help you develop wholesome mental qualities of uh, loving kindness and compassion and mutual consideration and mutual respect. Um, it can help you step outside of uh, your normal self-centered way of thinking into an other-centered way of thinking. So a loving relationship can be useful for developing uh, mental qualities that are helpful on the Buddhist path. Um, note that I said loving relationship. That does not necessarily mean a sexual relationship. Um, so there's an, a distinction to make there. Um, as for the precept, the precept for lay people is not broad. It's actually quite specific in what it's saying. Um, the precept for lay people uh, as the Buddha defines it in the suttas, um, covers a handful of very specific things. Um, first off, uh, refraining from sexual assault. Uh, so, briefly speaking, the third precept is simply not, uh, not breaking the boundaries of trust uh, in sexuality. So, uh, not engaging in sexual assault, but also, if you're in a relationship, not cheating on your partner. Um, or if you know somebody else is in a relationship, not engaging in their cheating on their partner. So not engaging in adultery either by breaking your own relationship or in participating in somebody else breaking the boundaries of their relationship. Uh, however, the third precept does not specify what kinds of relationships are acceptable. So the Buddha never said anything about the genders of people or the number of people involved. Um, so your relationship might involve people of the same gender. Um, it might involve more than two people. Um, these aren't, uh, these aren't mm, singled out as being problems in and of themselves, uh, as long as it's something which everybody is aware of. So if you have multiple partners simultaneously, then be clear with your partners that that's what's going on. Um, and where it gets uh, where it gets into the domain of clearly violating the precept is if you've got your main partner and then you've got your secret sidekick who the main partner doesn't know about. Um, that's definitely in the category of the unwholesome. Um, but if you're totally clear right from the start, um, I'm, I'm still going to be seeing other people. And the person is like, okay, I'm fine with that then as far as I can tell, that's not violating the third precept. It's still, however, probably cultivating greed and attachment in the mind. So it's still most likely on the side of the unwholesome. Next question. Did the Buddha talk about competition? If so, what were some of the things he discussed regarding this? Did he talk about competition? What comes to mind is, is the Buddha spoke about uh, not praising yourself at the expense of others. Um, he also spoke about not comparing yourself to others in the sense of saying, like, I'm better or I'm worse or I'm equal. Um, instead, what the Buddha uh, continually emphasized was to look at our own mind and work on overcoming our own defilements work on overcoming our own issues um, and not to get caught up in 
and constantly pointing the finger at, at other people. Uh, but instead, always to consider, well, what are my issues? Where am I getting caught in, in reactivity? Or where do I get upset or short-tempered? Um, and in terms of competition, uh, the only person we're in competition with is ourselves. So it doesn't matter where somebody else is at or, or what they're up to. What matters is how are we doing in our practice? So the only, uh, as far as I can see, there's, there's only two valid reasons that come immediately to mind for uh, examining other people. Well, okay, we'll start with two. Um, first is to look for inspiration. So you might have somebody who is more advanced in the practice in you, or more advanced in some areas at least. And then you might look to them as an inspiration. Like, okay, well, I have a hard time holding still in meditation, but uh, look at this guy. He's rock solid. Um, so look, well, I'm not saying you're rock solid, but <laughs> you're, you're actually pretty solid, I have to admit. So you, you look at him and you're like, oh, wow, he's rock solid. Uh, I want to be like that too. So it's an inspiration. You might also look at, uh, at others to see what you can do to help them. Um, and this gets a little more challenging because... Um, sometimes we convince ourselves we're trying to help when actually we're just acting out our own defilements. It's like, oh, I, I just want Stan to stop snoring in the meditation hall. I want to, I want to help him stop snoring. Well, we're not actually interested in helping him with anything. We just hate the snoring and want it to stop. So being, you, you have to be very careful and very honest with yourself uh, when you're looking to help others. <laughs> another, another thing you might do when looking at others is if you see faults in others is then to consider do I have the same faults if you see somebody else who, who gets angry easily or who gets upset uh, or who takes things personally then reflect do I get upset, do I get angry, do I take things personally do I also need to settle down a little bit. And you'll probably find that, yeah, actually you do. Um, so that's a useful thing, uh, that's another useful thing, but that's not about competition. Um, it's not like, uh, I mean, you, you can actually use this in a wholesome way. <coughs> Again, in the sense of inspiration. Um, like, I, I recall uh, when I was living at the Zen monastery uh, many years ago, um, so during meditation retreats, there was the option of staying up late and doing extra meditation. So it wasn't required. Um, it was kind of like slightly encouraged. <laughs> it was, so they would, they would make a, a hot drink using um, like rice porridge and molasses and honey. It's really good. Like they, they like slow cook the rice and mix in molasses and honey. So it's this this really delicious, energizing beverage. And they would put it out at the end of the last meditation period to give you a little extra boost so you could stay up late and meditate if you wanted to. So then you would get this scene of, uh, so you'd have like maybe 30 or 40 people on the retreat. And then after the last meditation period, there'd be five or 10 people who would go in and get their hot drink and then go back in the meditation hall to do more meditation. And often it did have kind of this macho competitive attitude of like, who's got to sit up the latest? And it's like, <laughs> I made it till 10 o'clock. And, and then you're like, but there's still two people in the meditation hall. I can't leave now. So you're like, okay, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. 10.30, 10.45. Holy hell, I'm really sleepy. But okay, okay, she left. Now I can leave. <laughs> so sometimes, uh, so that's a way where you can use that competitive attitude to your benefit, uh, using it to help encourage you. Um, or like uh, reading some of the, the stories in the suttas of uh, monks who experience, monks or nuns who experienced a great deal of abuse or hostility, and yet they continued their practice without being bothered. And it's like, wow, if they can do it, I want to be like that too. So that's a, that's a healthy way of 
taking the competitive attitude and, and making it beneficial, making it useful. <laughs> Next question. It says, when we're in the bathroom and someone knocks to see if it is occupied, it is hard to let them know we're in there or what's going on since we aren't allowed to talk. <laughs> I've never had this question. <laughs> I guess there really is a first time for everything. In the future, could we have bells in there for that purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing fancy, just something we can ring to let them know we'll be a while. <laughs> Actually, interestingly enough, this is covered in the Vinaya. Um, in the Vinaya, the, the Buddha says that the proper thing to do is to, to cough uh, or clear your throat, just so the person on the outside knows there's somebody on the inside. So if somebody comes and knocks, you just... <coughs> uh, and, then it, and it's quite innocent and harmless, like, oh, I'm just coughing, no reason whatsoever. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the person outside. So it, it, it doesn't feel like social interaction at all. Um, so that, this is actually quite a clever way of doing things. It was also relevant because at the Buddhist time, uh, door locks were not a common technology. Um, so he developed this little system of like, you would go up and you would cough and then the person inside would cough, and that's how you would communicate the bathroom was occupied. <laughs> okay. This says, what was this house before? Do you know anything about the people who lived here? Just curious. Well, immediately before, there was a small group of medical students who were staying here, I think. Is that right? Medical students? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. <laughs> they were somewhat medical, or somewhat students. Um, I think that just after, <coughs> hurricane, um, just after Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, this was also a base for some of the relief work that was happening in the area. Um, before that, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know? Mm, there was nothing. Okay. There, there was absolutely nothing. There was a, a blank <laughs> void right here. <laughs> Basically, there was a blank void until we decided we needed a meditation center. Exactly. Um, and then this <laughs> popped into being looking like an old, run-down house. Uh, so it looks like it's 80 years old, but it, it actually just popped into existence a year ago. A year and a half ago. Okay. There's somebody who always makes little squiggles at the top of their notes. I don't know who this is, but it's... A distinct trademark. <laughs> I've tried to read some Buddhist books during the retreat, but it felt like sensory overload. I've had this happen before during long meditation sessions where my mind felt very sensitive and raw afterwards. I'm concerned because the retreat ends on Monday and on Tuesday I'll be back at work sitting at my desk and dealing with that excrement storm. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions for those of us who have to return to the marketplace when this is over? Yeah, quit your job. <laughs> oh, God. People always think I'm joking. <laughs> Every now and then it actually works. I'll be talking to someone and I'll be going on and on about how much they hate their job and how it makes it so hard for them to practice. And I'm like, well, then just quit your job. And I find out later that they actually did quit their job and then got something else they liked a lot better. Um, so don't be afraid to reconsider the life choices you've made. You're not stuck with them. Um, uh, actually, one of her friends was working, actually got like multiple degrees in a field that it turned out she hated. Um, and then when she was, what, 35, she quit her field and started working as a photographer. Um, so, uh, again, multiple degrees. Most people would think, oh, now I'm obligated to work in this field for the rest of my life because I spent so much time... Foreign politics. Yeah, I mean, seriously, foreign politics. From the UN to photography. Yeah. Very successful photographer. 
<laughs> anyway, point being, you can always turn your life around. You're not stuck on your chosen career. You can always do something different. Um, as for, okay, first off, regarding reading books, it's like I said at the beginning of the retreat, during meditation retreats, sometimes reading books is helpful in that it gives you uh, inspiration and a sense of, of how to practice. But sometimes it's actually detrimental because it, it keeps the mind moving and full of noise, uh, which can make it more difficult to concentrate and focus on your meditation practice. So often during long meditation retreats, I won't read very much. Um, it depends on what I'm interested in getting out of the retreat. Um, as for uh, being back at work on Tuesday, you'll deal with that on Tuesday. <laughs> but don't be scared of anything. It's, it's just your own mind. Let's see. I have started reading The Wings to Awakening this week and I am finding it useful. What do you think of this book and Tanisro Bhikkhu's writings in general? Um, do I have to be politically correct on Facebook Live? Damn it. <laughs> um, in The Wings of Awakening, he uses the word stress, where most others would say suffering when he discusses the Four Noble Truths. This seems like a much more comprehensible translation, but perhaps it is taking too much liberty. What do you think? So I read the book The Wings to Awakening uh, several years ago. And at the time, I found it quite interesting, actually. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a huge fan of many of his books, uh, most of his books. Um, but that one in particular, I did like. Um, as for his translations of Pali terms, yeah, I frequently dislike his translations of Pali terms. And translating dukkha as stress is one that I, I find particularly uh, inaccurate. Um, I do agree that suffering is a bit too heavy of a word for dukkha. I tend to prefer discontent or dissatisfaction um, or unpleasantness, uh, like words which, which communicate more, uh, a more nuanced or broad range of meaning. Because when you hear the word suffering, we tend to think of agony, misery, and torment. And that's part of dukkha, but dukkha is also when you stub your toe. Uh, dukkha is also when the tea is a little too bitter. Uh, dukkha is also when someone's upset at you, but you don't know why. Um, dukkha is also uh, when you're feeling a little bit tired, but you can't take a nap. Like, dukkha is all of these things. Um, as well as like getting stabbed and, and beaten and all those other stuff as well. So, yeah, I like, uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that dukkha is, uh, it's not necessarily a physical experience, it's a mental experience. It's that mental experience of dissatisfaction, of discontent, of, uh, of not being totally okay with what's going on. So I'm not a fan of stress. Um, well, I'm not a fan of stress in general, in life. But I'm also not a fan of the word stress in translating dukkha. Yeah, I like dissatisfaction or discontent. Um, I think that pins it down a bit more closely. I've noticed an impromptu sign language developing amongst the retreatants as a result of our vow of silence. Okay, I'm not quite sure you're grasping the idea of noble silence. Noble silence doesn't mean try to find ways to communicate without words. Noble silence means withdraw from social interaction entirely. It means don't engage in any unnecessary communication. So coming up with some like system of like signals and gestures so that you don't have to use words is totally missing the point. Um, so even if you know an actual formal sign language, don't use it during retreats. <laughs> so, continues. Is there an official Buddhist sign language that is used? <laughs> <laughs> um, to the best of my knowledge, no. <laughs> and is it common for monks to take long vows of silence? So in Buddhism, silence is normally done as part of uh, meditation retreats. 
but outside of meditation retreats, it's not very common. Um, so, uh, and, and that said, some meditation retreats might last for, for quite long periods of time. For example, in the Tibetan tradition, it's common to do a three-year retreat once in your lifetime, uh, or at least once in your lifetime. Um, and actually, as I understand it, that's usually done, uh, it's often done as a solitary retreat, so like three years of solitude, which then naturally involves noble silence, since there's only, <laughs> only yourself to talk to. Uh, you might talk to yourself a lot in that case, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, what, what is common is in, in monasteries, in many monasteries, there's an encouragement to minimize unnecessary speech. So it's not like the strict silence that's kept during, during meditation retreats, but it's more a general encouragement to always consider how our choices are affecting our mind. Um, so if you're sitting around uh, chatting about books and movies and games all day long, then your meditation practice is not going to be very good because that's going to keep coming up in the mind. So, uh, monks and nuns will often avoid engaging in conversations about worldly matters or secular things because it's not good for your meditation practice. So generally speaking, I prefer to talk about Dhamma uh, or about the Pali language, but uh, other topics, not so much. Not so much, it's not terribly useful. Sometimes it's useful, but usually it's not terribly useful. Let's see. I really like the angel on top of the Christmas tree. Um, how she's respecting the Buddha. Uh, a peaceful and very nice spirit. Uh, what do you think? I agree with you. Yeah, she's, she's got her hands in Anjali. That's awesome. She's got her hands together. Yeah, it was really nice. So as I mentioned before, it was during the, the previous retreat then um, uh, some of our regular uh, meditators went and got, a, got this tree and brought it and set it up. And, uh, it was really lovely. I was really happy about it. Um, during my stay here, I have been walking outside, uh, not for beauty view or just to see people. I did meditation walk. It's a very quiet town and I see how things change every day. Um, and about belief, I saw Christ. Uh, are you talking about like the, there's this big Jesus statue in somebody's <laughs> yard on the block over here? <laughs> has, has anybody else seen it? I see it. Yeah, it's very noticeable. Um, it's only, it's less than a block away from here, but there's, there's a house nearby here where, where somebody has like a larger than life size um, statue of Jesus hanging on the cross in their yeah. front yard. And, and also all these big signs commanding us to repent and the kingdom of heaven is here and all this other stuff. So I kind of respect it. I mean, because that, that person clearly wants everyone to be happy in, in their understanding of happiness. So I'd actually suggested that we do the same, have like a huge statue <laughs> with, with quotes uh, saying like, you, you must purify your mind or you will be stuck in samsara for eternity, something like that. But she, she didn't like that idea. <laughs> I keep meditation with eyes open, uh, awareness and no question in mind. I just see thoughts coming and going. Uh, it's helped me about meditation. Do you have any suggestions about it or should I stop doing it? I think it's fine. Um, again, it's, it's mostly about keeping the, uh, the mind of meditation. So keeping our attention firmly focused on the body, firmly focused on our present moment experience developing wholesome mind states, letting go of unwholesome mind states, and so on. That's the important thing. 
So walking meditation can be a, an extremely powerful practice um, if we really make an effort uh, to make it a powerful practice. Three question about meditation. I've been sitting uh, about 30 to 35 minutes and now I get through the pain, but when it turns into an hour, the pain is coming back. Any suggestion? Yeah, stay with it. It's great the pain is coming back. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, uh, I remember uh, early on, I, I was, so when I was living at the Zen monastery, and at one point I, I went to one of the teachers and I was like, uh, I'm just, I'm having a, so much pain in my meditation. What do you recommend? And she was like, that's good. That's good. It's really good that you have pain in your meditation. And I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. And, and so the point here is that if there's, uh, so pain arising is indicating that we have not yet worked through our aversion to pain. We've not yet figured out the nature of pain. So then it's important to push through that. It's important to examine that so that we can come to an understanding of it. Once you come to an understanding of pain, you will never experience it the same way again. It changes for the rest of your life. Uh, next question. Are the sutta translations that you discussed this week posted on the Buddhist Insights webpage? Uh, not currently. Um, I've been tacking them on the bulletin board, as people have probably noticed. Um, and if people want copies, I'm happy to send them by email afterwards. Yeah, we'll yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. maybe we'll just send them, send them to everyone. We'll send a copy of the suttas to everyone. Uh, although super cute, Stan looks so grumpy and miserable in his Elizabeth collar. <laughs> Is that bad for his cat karma? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish we didn't have to use the collar, but every now and then he starts he starts injuring himself and it becomes necessary. Next question. In the sutra you read tonight, instead of saying what the Buddha said about hearing, could you instead say, if you hear the sound directly as it is right now without interference from the mind? So as they say in Zen, too many words. Uh, the Buddha said it very directly. Uh, in the herd, uh, there will be just the herd. In the herd, there is just the herd. But he said it very directly, so your expansion of it is fine, um, but it's, it's a little more specific. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Interference from the mind. Interference from the mind. No, because there's also awareness of mental activity. It's awareness that the mind is just the mind. So there's awareness that hearing is just hearing, but there's also awareness that the mind is just the mind. So whether or not there's interference from the mind is beside the point. The point is, are we aware of it without building a sense of self out of it? That's the important piece. So I would leave what the Buddha said as it's written, uh, as he's spoken. Next question. I know you told us to get creative with our meditations on impermanence. I've been meditating on A, the fracturing of all my social relations, <laughs> <laughs> familial, friendship, etc or B, the different ways my body could die. <laughs> cool. Just checking to see if that's within what you said in your Dhamma talk, or if there are flaws to these approaches. Those are fine. That's not 
actually what I've been recommending. Those are both perfectly good meditation practices, by the way. Um, those are good ways of breaking down coarser attachments. Um, so the contemplation of death that you mentioned is another meditation technique the Buddha recommends. Um, and the <laughs> fracturing of social relations, I would say, fits under the, the third of the five daily contemplations. So the third one is that everything we love will change and be separated from us. Fourth, sorry, the fourth of the five daily reflections. So while related to impermanence, uh, it's somewhat different from the perception of impermanence. The perception of impermanence is directly feeling the constant change every moment. That's what I'm encouraging uh, people to develop. The direct experience of constant change, moment after moment. So that's a somewhat different thing than what you're talking about here. Again, the techniques you're talking about are good. They're good techniques. Uh, it's just uh, a different meditation technique than I've been talking about. Two, sometimes in my practice I experience self-doubt that I'll ever progress on the path. Then I don't practice sitting for a while. Do you have suggestions for how to deal with these self-doubts? like activities. One of the problems here is that you seem to think that sitting is practice. Um, practice is not sitting. Practice is what we're doing with our mind in every single waking moment. So it's always considering, what am I doing with my mind right now? And then always doing what we can to shift the mind towards the wholesome. So then, as far as experiencing doubt about progress, are you saying you've never experienced any progress at all? I find that very hard to believe. So uh, I'm willing to bet that you've experienced some progress. Even people that are brand new to meditation practice or brand new to Buddhism notice a difference after a single meditation period. So I would encourage you to reflect on what progress you do make. Reflect on what benefits you do notice, no matter how small or slight, because recognizing that you are in fact making a difference indicates that if you just keep going in that direction, eventually you'll go all the way. Yeah, if you just give up on practicing, then that's the most surefire way to stop making progress. Um, so continue your practice, and you'll keep making progress. Next question. Okay, this is creative. Um. <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand this. Oh, oh, okay, I get it. What? Um, it's a helicopter. <laughs> like, it's supposed to... Ah. Oh. <laughs> okay, someone's bored. <laughs> <coughs> Four, why do you have chickens? Did you save them from a poultry place? Close. Uh, they were abandoned. Um, so, we took them in. Do not leave animals, unwanted animals, though. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't leave more here. Like, uh, at Bhavana Society, uh, they have a cat there. Um, at least I assume they do. I haven't been in a while. Do you know, is, is Madhu still around? Is she still alive? Mm -hmm. Okay. They have a cat there. Um, and the way it happened was just in the middle of the night, uh, someone just like drove up to the monastery, like tossed a cat in the door, and then drove away. <laughs> um, so one of the monks, just in the middle of the night, he starts hearing this meowing outside his door. And, and at first he thought he was dreaming or he was crazy or like going out of his mind or something. And then he was like, no, no, that really is a cat meowing. This is so strange. And he goes and he opens the door, and there's this cute little orange cat sitting there. 
So they were like, okay, I guess we have to take take this cat in. Yeah, do not do that here. Yeah, if you do that, <laughs> yeah, bad karma. Like, this is not a dumping ground for animals. Um, so we were happy to uh, to shelter those two chickens, but that's that's enough. <laughs> Maybe someday when we have more space and more resources, then we can shelter more animals. But for now, that's, that's about our limit. Yeah, they live a nice life. They have a huge yard to run around in. There's lots of things for them to peck at and taste. And, um, yeah. Recently I saw an episode of Tasting Table on Netflix. It's a show that normally profiles famous chefs and their food. However, however, in one episode they profile a Korean Buddhist monk. Nun. Nun. Uh, I believe her name is Jun, Jun Kukin. Uh, the monastery, you know of this lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've never met her, but I've heard about her. The monastery is located in the mountains of South Korea. Do monks ever watch TV? If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest it as it's quite beautiful. <laughs> um, it occurred to me, however, that even though she cooks a vegan diet and doesn't cook with garlic and onions, etc., that showcasing food would be considered unwholesome. Thoughts? Granted, a famous chef randomly found her and got her an episode on Netflix and an article in the Times, but still. <laughs> Um, well, I don't watch TV personally. Um, yeah, I, I think it's quite unlikely I'm going to watch this episode uh, of Tasting Table. Um, so I think more notable here is that uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that showcasing food would be considered unwholesome because if part of her mission is to encourage people to use less animal products and therefore to reduce the factory farming industry, um, then that's a noble mission. Uh, so the factory farming industry is really terrible. It's really awful. Uh, so doing what we can to minimize uh, or eliminate the amount of money that we give to the factory farming industry is a very good thing. Um, so if she, uh, if this episode of her teaching people to cook vegan food leads to people buying less animal products from factory farms, I'm I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Is it immoral for me to purchase a dumb buck? Dhamma book licensed for free distribution. The book Broadview Boundless Heart of, is out of print and hard to find, but I recall seeing a copy on Amazon a couple years back. Um, I would say it's immoral for someone to be selling them, uh, especially since the books very clearly state free distribution only, this book is not to be sold. Um, so I think it's, it's immoral that someone is selling it in so clear contradiction to the, the principles that the book was produced on, on, under. Um, I don't think it's immoral for you to buy it. Um, I think it's a bit silly. What I would encourage you instead is to ask that they do another printing run of it. Um, you can also probably find an ebook of it online. Most of the free distribution books are available in, in free ebook form as well. Yeah, the only issue I see with buying it is that then you might encourage the person to continue selling free distribution books, which is not something I would want to encourage. Two, do people make contact with devas while on drugs? I recall a couple of years ago on the dark web, there was a vendor who had stopped selling and doing drugs because Mother Boa had told him to during a DMT trip. That seems like a Deva kind of thing to do. 
Side note, he would give you drugs if you answered impossible koans, such as, prove to me these drugs will benefit your life. Cool. <laughs> so I do believe that sometimes um, drugs, and particularly some drugs in, in specific, can open a person's mind to contact with devas. I do believe that's possible. Um, I would not recommend taking drugs just for that purpose though. That's not, yeah, I, I don't recommend it. Um, yeah, and the story is not implausible. Uh, I could, uh, I've heard similar stories um, of people taking drugs and then meeting devas who tell them that they're it's time for them to stop taking drugs. <laughs> this says, thanks to Giovanna for all the warmth and nourishment. Does she have an Amazon wish list as well? <laughs> uh, you're welcome. <laughs> list enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to work for it. <laughs> Let's see. Do you think you were a monk or nun in a past life, or is this your first time at the monastic rodeo? <laughs> <laughs> Technically speaking, um, we've all been monks and nuns at some point in the past, just probably, uh, just in some of our cases, not recently. Uh, in my case, I actually am pretty solidly conven convinced I was a monk or nun very recently, uh, either in a previous life or uh, a couple lifetimes ago, for a number of reasons. Um, one of the major reasons why was because when I first started studying the Vinaya, I had a feeling of coming home. I had a feeling of deep, deep familiarity and comfort. Again, like the feeling when you've been away from home for a long time and then you, you walk through the door and there's that feeling of coming home. That was what it was like for me when I started studying the monastic code. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably certain I, I was a monastic in a recent life. It would also explain why when I first learned about, uh, learned about Buddhism that uh, I had an immediate connection with it. Uh, and also why I, within a very short amount of time, I determined that uh, I was going to be a monk. Uh, is it possible to reach a meditative state in less traditional forms, like surfing or music? For example, can you reach a meditative state while playing an instrument? If so, is it possible to reach jhana? Also, do you ever fall asleep while meditating? Um, it depends on what you mean by meditative state. So if you just mean a heightened mindfulness, then you can have heightened mindfulness in any circumstance. In fact, I recommend it. But no, as I understand it, you cannot get jhana while playing a musical instrument. For one thing, you'd probably drop your instrument. Um, yeah, the mind in jhana is not involved with anything whatsoever except for the object of concentration. So you could not possibly be playing a musical instrument at the time. It just doesn't work. Similarly, with surfing, there's just too much going on. Um, there's, it's not possible to get jhana while surfing either. There's, just, it's, there's too much going on. The mind, is, the mind may be very present, but it's not still. The mind needs to be very still in order to reach jhana. Um, as for, do I ever fall asleep while meditating? Well, odds are you'll get an example of that over the next few hours, um, because I'm actually, I'm a little bit ill right now, so my, my physical energy is low. So I'm still going to stay up till midnight um, as planned, um, but I, I may not be in my best form. Um, I used to have a lot of trouble with falling asleep while meditating. 
Uh, I still do it from time to time, but not not as not like it used to be. Um, yeah, at this point, I I know enough tricks uh, that it doesn't usually get the better of me. Uh, but every once in a while, like um, if I'm really tired or if I'm sick or um, or if there's something else going on that that makes it hard for me, then I might, I might doze off once in a while. It does happen. Okay, this is a whole stack of all of ones. <laughs> If I prepare to become a monk but want to donate lots of money to make sure that the monastery has enough resources, for example, food, medicine, etc., is that an unwholesome thought because I am preparing against scarcity based on my fears? <laughs> uh, what actually comes to mind is right before I became a monk, uh, I still had some money left. Not very much, but I still had some money left. So I ordered bulk cocoa powder for the monastery. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, got, I ordered something like 50 pounds of cocoa powder. Um, and it lasted for like the first two years that I was a monk. There was, <laughs> there was always cocoa for the first two months. And the first two years. First two years. Um, so was... <laughs> Was there, was there some selfishness there? Yeah, there was. Um, but there's, there's also, there was also an element of generosity because it was for the whole community. Um, so it wasn't just me drinking myself to death on cocoa. Uh, but it was, it was sharing it with the whole community. And it just so happened that I was part of the community. <laughs> totally coincidental. <laughs> So in this case, it sounds to me like... Uh, and so really what it comes down to is your intentions. If you're actually doing it with a solely selfish intention, then that's unwholesome. But if you're doing it with the, the intention of helping out the monastery, then that's wholesome. And if you're doing it for both, then that's mixed. But I would say, even if it's both, go ahead and do it anyway, because that's a, a huge amount of good karma. Uh, which balances out that the selfishness that's wrapped in. The other element here, though, is also uh, having faith in the system the Buddha established, having faith in monasticism. Mm. Uh, generally speaking, uh, once you become a monastic, you will never be without enough food unless you live in, in certain very poor parts of the world. Um, but even there, um, I know people who've, who've lived in, in some of the most poverty-stricken parts of the world, and they still were given enough food to survive. Um, like people who are living in the, the hill country in the north part of Thailand. Um, and yeah, the people there barely had enough food to feed themselves, but they still managed to put aside enough to keep their, their local monk alive. So just have faith that the Buddha established a functional system and that when you join that system, if you keep up your end of the deal by being a good monk, then the system will keep up its end of the deal by keeping you alive. It works. It's been working for 2,500 years. It still works. Two, if enlightenment is defined as a sentient being without any attachments, would an AI robot be considered as being enlightened? Assuming that this robot will come into existence in our lifetime that can act, behave uh, like a human without all the human attachment baggage. Well, that gets into a different question, which is, would a, an AI be sentient? Would it have consciousness? Is it possible to be reborn as an AI? And there's debate around this issue. Um, uh, because one of the big issues is that uh, like computers as we currently have them are entirely 
deterministic. Uh, so currently computers actually cannot think for themselves. They're incapable of it. They can mimic thinking for themselves, but they do so through very complex algorithms and uh, uh, programming that makes it seem like they're making decisions, but they're not actually making decisions the way you or I do. All their quote-unquote decisions are predictable. Um, technically speaking, as I understand it, it's not even possible for a computer to generate a random number. What we call a random number generator on a computer is actually a very long list of numbers um, that, again, are usually generated by a particular algorithm. They do crazy things like take a ridiculously huge number and make it into a fraction and convert that into a decimal. And this gives you a string of seemingly random numbers, but it's not random. It's actually produced through a predictable way. So such things as that, if that's what we're calling AI, then no. It cannot be a sentient being. It cannot be a conscious being because it has no intention. It has no volition. It lacks the ability to make choices. So the ability to make choices is one of the basic defining characteristics of a sentient being. So you need to have an AI that's capable of genuinely making choices. Um, and yeah, our technology is not there yet. Um, it may eventually be there, uh, at which point this would become a valid question. But for the time being, it's not there. And I don't think it's even feasible with current technology. You would know better than I do. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> um, but no, an AI robot would not be considered enlightened. Uh, because if they did develop a machine which was uh, capable of housing a sentient volitional consciousness, then that would be a being reborn into that body. And that being would have attachments. So they would not be enlightened by default. They would still have to practice just as the rest of us do. Three, do you find that your path to enlightenment gets easier or harder over time in meditation practice? It gets easier. It actually does get easier. Um, it gets easier, but also you learn more nuances and more subtleties, uh, which is kind of encouraging, actually, because uh, in, in the beginning, it can seem very simple. Like you go and to learn meditation and someone's like, just sit down and pay attention to your breathing. Sit down and follow your breath. And you're like, that's it? That's Buddhism? Boring. <laughs> but then you start practicing and, and things start to open up. You start learning that there's other meditation techniques. And you start learning the reason why there's different meditation techniques is to work through different characteristics of mind. And you start to learn about all the different Please not turn talks. Thank you. Um, you learn about all the different uh, ways that we can reshape or restructure the mind and the thinking processes. Uh, and also you start to understand the more profound aspects of Buddhist philosophy. So it, it opens up uh, and starts to become extraordinarily engrossing uh, and engaging and interesting. Yeah, overall it gets easier because uh, you're building up momentum. You're building up skill. Uh, you're building up experience. Four, why don't you join forces with the lovely, oh, the lone, not lovely. Why don't you join forces with the lone Sri Lankan monk that you mentioned? Wouldn't it be easier to have a team with a single mission? Um, is it because of some fundamental sectarian differences? Uh, well, he comes and teaches with us from time to time and I go and teach at his place from time to time. So in that sense, we, we already support each other to a certain degree, uh, in that we both help out each other's programs. But, uh, no, it wouldn't make sense for, I don't think, at least currently, as things currently are, it wouldn't make sense for uh, us to be the same organization, because we're doing somewhat different things. There's some overlap between what we're doing, uh, which is why we're able to have the, the interaction that we do. But we are doing somewhat different things. So yeah, it doesn't quite make sense at this point. It's not because of sectarian differences. He's a very open-minded uh, monk. He's a, he's a really wonderful guy. I, like, I really highly recommend 
uh, meeting him and spending time with him. In fact, there's some flyers for his meditation center uh, on the shoe rack over there. But no, it's just that he's doing something a bit different than what we're doing here. So it, it doesn't quite mesh perfectly. It says, aren't all, aren't all karma mixed with both wholesome and unwholesome qualities? My generosity is mixed with my selfish desire for good karma. A vigilante seemingly law-breaking immoral behavior is mixed with his desire to bring peace breakers to justice. Our meditation efforts are mixed with our personal desires for enlightenment. Or am I overthinking this? You're overthinking this. <laughs> So it is possible to have generosity without selfishness, for example. Um, if it's not something you've experienced, try. <laughs> try to give a gift purely to make somebody else happy, without any thought of return. Try. Um, also, I don't like the equation of law-breaking with immorality, because not all laws are moral and not all law-breaking is immoral. Um, so let's not get those confused, because they're different things. Um, as for our meditation efforts being mixed with our personal desires for enlightenment, yeah, um, keep that one for now. The personal desire for enlightenment helps keep you on the path. Without it, why are we here? And seriously. Uh, if we don't have the desire for enlightenment, then we're not likely to move towards enlightenment. So for the time being, keep that one. You'll need to let go of it later when you're right at the edge of completion. You'll need to let go of it. But for now, you don't need to let go of it. Uh, for, the now you, for now, you want to stoke that. So in, in Vajrayana, they call that uh, bodhicitta. Uh, the mind that seeks enlightenment, the mind that seeks awakening. I think they use the same word in uh, Mahayana as well. Uh, Bodhi mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, the mind that seeks awakening, it's a good thing. Six, if someone does me harm financially, is it karmically correct to bring that person to justice instead of personal revenge? Or am I supposed to let it go? But what if this person keeps doing this to others? If I tell myself that it's to prevent this from happening to others, am I rationalizing? I can see how this karma intent game can be extended to justify anything. It's not a game. Um, it's about sincerely asking yourself, why am I doing this? And seeing what the answer is. Uh, but in this case, if somebody does you harm financially, you actually might want to let it go. You might want to try letting it go. What's the big deal? It's just money. People get way too caught up about money. Um, if that person keeps doing it to others, that's their karma. Uh, that's their own bad karma that they're creating. Uh, it's not your job to go around trying to uh, change, like, like trying to get other people to stop making bad karma, though you can. Um, you can try to convince people that their ways are in error. Uh, you can do that if you like to, and that can be a wholesome thing to do. But just trying to see other people punished because you don't approve of what they're doing, yeah, that strikes me as vindictiveness rather than compassion. Um, so that, that doesn't seem quite right to me. So yeah, I would look at your mind very carefully on this one. Okay, seven. Are all attachments equally weighted? For example, is attachment to working hard just as bad as being a complete lazy bum? How about karma? How about the no killing and no lie thing? Are they equally weighted in terms of effect on karma? No, uh, each thing carries its own weight. So there's a huge difference between killing and telling lies. Killing is much heavier karma. 
Any suggestions on what kind of music to listen to during working out? How about none? <laughs> How about just not listening to music and instead practicing mindfulness of the body? Uh, I used to do long distance running and I found it to be, uh, it, it's kind of just like fast walking meditation. Um, well, I mean, very fast walking meditation. <laughs> but still, it, had that, it has that same quality of being fully aware of the body, of, of, being, of closely paying attention to one's physical experience. So I found, uh, I found long distance running to be actually supportive to my practice. But I was not listening to music while I was doing it. Uh, that seems like it would kind of spoil the, the contemplative value of it says, I'm starting to think modern music that's full of words about love, sadness, anger, sex, etc. is probably bad for maintaining peace. I think that's wise. Nine, not trying to say that I don't like it, but is doing a four-hour meditation just as effective as four one-hour meditations? I would think latter is better as it develops a habit, not to mention less stressful for newbie meditators like me. <laughs> You guys are really terrified of it. <laughs> What's the big deal? I don't understand. And no, it's not the same. It's really not. Uh, the thing about a long period of time is that you eventually you get to a point where you stop fighting. You stop fighting the process. What I've noticed is that even an hour-long meditation, you can waste an entire hour. An hour-long meditation, you can spend a whole hour obsessing about how much your body hurts. An hour-long meditation, you can spend the whole time thinking about cheese and novels. An hour-long meditation, you can spend the whole time spacing out. Four hours, after the first hour and a half or two hours, you just start running out of ways to avoid meditating. <laughs> and eventually you get to a point where you're like, look, I'm stuck here, I might as well actually meditate. Because then when you meditate, then you find peace, joy, and contentment right here and right now. And you're like, so avoiding meditation is making me anxious and upset and agitated and disturbed. Craving for the bell to ring so I can end is also making me agitated and upset. Uh, obsessing about the pain in my body is making me agitated and upset. Why don't I just drop all those things and just practice wholeheartedly? Why don't I just make a sincere, genuine effort to practice meditation? And what else are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can actually kind of sneak into this technique by uh, when you sit down to meditate, uh, you, you take on the mindset that you will never get up. The meditation period will never end. <laughs> if you take on this mindset sincerely, then it will radically change the character of your meditation. Your meditation practice will get much stronger. Everyone's face went um, and the, the, thing about, the thing about having a, a really long period, like three or four hours, is that it's much easier to convince yourself it's never going to end. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you'll see. You, you just get to a point where you're just like, I might as well actually meditate. I haven't really been meditating for the whole retreat. But I might as well actually meditate. And it goes on, I used to train people in gym and I always told them persistence over a period of time always beats one crazy session. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about both? What do you think retreats are? Retreats are one crazy session. But you use them on top of your regular daily meditation practice in order to get good results. So if you only do retreats, like once or twice a year you do a week-long retreat, it's not actually very useful. Or if you only do daily practice, but you never do retreats, that's also, actually that's still kind of useful, but not, not as useful. But to have a solid daily practice and to frequently do retreats, that will have a very profound impact on the mind. 
So similarly, I'm not saying that you should do a four-hour meditation every single day. But once in a while, push your limits. Once in a while, push yourself not just a little bit farther, but push yourself way beyond your comfort zone and see what happens. And you'll find out that your limits are much vaster than you thought they were. Similarly, when I first heard about the four-hour meditation, I was just like, that's insane. This, this monk is out of his mind. What is he talking about? <laughs> um, and I had never sat for longer than like an hour and a half. And I was like, an hour and a half was already agonizing. Why would I want to do four hours? And, but then I actually did it. And I was like, well, turns out my limits are a lot farther out than I thought they were. And actually what, I've, what I found um, is that when it got to the end of the four hours, I didn't want to stop. I wanted to keep going. And on some days I would keep going. On some days I, I pushed it to four and a half hours or five hours just because I didn't want to get up. Because you get to a point where the mind is so sharp and so clear and so peaceful and so focused that you're like, why would I want this to end? So it's, it can be a really amazing thing. Um, Yes, I lie. I do not like the idea of four-hour meditation. <laughs> Maybe later. Too early. Yeah, later is in, in a few minutes. <laughs> there was a, a, a lovely story of Ajahn Chah where... Uh, I forget the exact details of the story, but a, a monk was, uh, he was assigned to do some work and, and he really didn't want to do it. And he's sitting there like, I hate this so much. And, and Ajahn Chah just said to him, thinking about it is hard, doing it is easy. Uh, in the same way, thinking about a four hour meditation is hard, doing it is easy. You just sit down. And then a few hours later, you get up. <laughs> What's the big deal? <laughs> okay, so this one is about someone's missing their socks. <laughs> um, I'll read that after we're done with the Q&A, so that it's not immortalized forever on Facebook, that somebody, <laughs> somebody lost their socks during the retreat. <laughs> this one says, where does intuition lie in regards to Buddhism? You're right, intuition does lie very frequently. Uh, where does intuition lie in regards to Buddhism? How can one nurture and trust one's gut feeling that it doesn't follow some mindless positive thinking or made-up story? So we have to be very careful with what we call intuition. Because often what we think is intuition is just our defilements. What we think is intuition is just our habits of greed, hatred, and delusion. Like right now, my intuition is telling me to eat vanilla ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> my intuition is telling me to go to bed. Yeah, that's not intuition, that's just desire and craving. Or, my intuition is telling me to slap this guy right in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's not intuition, that's just hatred. Um, these are, so we need to be very careful, because your gut feeling is usually wrong. Your gut feeling is usually just greed, hatred, and delusion. <laughs> and every, uh, we do, so there, there is such a thing as intuition. There is such a thing as directly knowing. But, uh, it's extremely clear, it's very precise. There's no shred of doubt in the mind. The mind is not clouded at all. There's no trace of unwholesomeness in the mind. Um, so that's quite different. Uh, normally when people talk about intuition, they just mean they have this feeling they should do something. Um, but yeah, that's not wholesome usually. Usually that's just uh, desire and aversion. That said, we do have something uh, called conscience, the ability to recognize that something is, is wholesome or unwholesome. 
So that is something to watch. Um, so for example, if I'm about to do something unwholesome, I can feel it in my body. Um, I can feel it in my mind. I can't describe exactly what that feeling is like, but I know. I know that I'm about to do something bad, and that means I should probably stop. And sometimes I stop, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but then afterwards I reflect, and I was like, oh. I knew exactly what I was doing, and I did it anyway. <laughs> so learning to listen to your conscience, to that little spark that says, I'm about to do something bad, maybe I should stop. Learn how to pay attention to that. That's a good thing. Somewhat related, I've had to let go of many things since setting foot on the path to absolute truth, like my career change. I've yet to figure this out, and time is money in New York City. Signed, happy wanderer, yet now questioning happiness. To some extent, uh, we can just recognize that once we set our sights on enlightenment, then that becomes our most important thing. Um, so little details uh, that aren't directly related to awakening become much less important. So whether you have one boring job or another boring job turns out to not actually be that relevant, as long as your job is not harmful to your practice and as long as you're making enough money to support yourself while you do your practice. That said, if your career change is directly related to your practice, like you're thinking of um, quitting your job at the, um, the hitman agency and starting a job volunteering at homeless shelters or something, that would be great. I would say go ahead and do that right away. Don't wait. Uh, but if your career change is just like whether I work in the accounting department at that company or work in the accounting department at this other country uh, company, yeah, I'm not really sure it makes a huge difference. Unless like one company is Monsanto and the other is Whole Foods or something. That's a different story. Actually, Whole Foods is owned by Amazon these days, a bad example. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, considering the, the ethical implications of your work, but otherwise, not making too big a deal about it. To set your mind on enlightenment and uh, don't get too caught up in other things. Two, is it okay to visualize objects? I favored a lighthouse that watches out for thoughts. Or is this considered a daydream? I am not a fan. Not a fan. Yeah, this gets into dangerous territory. Um, it gets into dangerous territory of, uh, yeah, daydreaming, spacing out, uh, imagination. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, you might do it at the very beginning just to establish a mind of vigilance and watchfulness. But then once you've established that mind, then just focus on maintaining that mind. Um, and let the, the lighthouse visual disappear. It says, three, wishing everyone a happy and metta new year. Aww. Aww. You too. Okay, next question. One, about the middle way. Would it be possible to explain about this topic a bit more? How to apply to meditation practice and daily life in general? Well, it depends on what you mean by middle way. Um, so the most common thing that, that is called the middle way in the suttas is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is a very detailed map for how to live daily life and also what to do in meditation practice. So that would be a fairly direct answer. However, you might have noticed that in the Kachanagota Sutta, the Buddha in that place defines the middle way as the uh, perception of emptiness and contemplation of dependent origination. So that's another way you could practice the middle way, is by constantly maintaining the perception of emptiness and uh, the causal nature of all phenomena. Or just follow the Noble Eightfold Path, um, if that's easier. 
Two, about the four sublime states of mind, loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy, still involve desire, wishful thoughts, desire causes suffering, how do we balance them? That's not correct. Loving kindness, compassion, and, sym and sympathetic joy do not necessarily involve desire. Um, so all of these at their heart are a feeling, an attitude of mind. So in the beginning, we might use wishes um, to help us get in touch with that feeling. But once we have the feeling, we just stay with that feeling. We just stay focused on magnifying and maintaining that feeling. Um, so that doesn't involve desire. Uh, it's just a meditation object. Equanimity. How do we differentiate um, from letting go in ignorance? What is the core concept? So equanimity is uh, the balanced state of mind where we don't fall into either desire or aversion. We don't fall into either liking or disliking. So, in equanimity, everything is totally okay. That's the mind state of equanimity. There is a close relationship here to letting go, in that uh, in developing equanimity, we are letting go of our preferences. We're letting go of our liking and disliking. We're letting go of uh, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Um, whereas ignorance is just not knowing, it's not understanding. So the ignorance doesn't have anything to do with equanimity. Ignorance is an, is an unpleasant state. Uh, whoever said ignorance is bliss was not Buddhist. Uh, and in Buddhism we say ignorance is dukkha. Okay. Four more questions. Any more stories of monks pushed to enlightenment to inspire us for the rest of the marathon? <laughs> no. Um, also, <laughs> where's the person with the laugh sign? <laughs> um, well, I will remind you of what the Buddha thought um, when he sat down at the base of the Bodhi tree the night before he attained enlightenment. He sat down and he said, let my blood dry up and my flesh wither till there's nothing left but skin and bones, but I will not get up from this seat until I attain awakening. Okay, that was supposed to be inspiring. <laughs> Clearly not inspiring. <laughs> So basically he's saying, I'm going to sit here until I attain awakening, even if my body withers away in the process. I'm still not getting up until I get it. Okay, the inspiration level is low. Apparently that wasn't, wasn't the right one to pick. I actually found that quite disturbing when I first heard it. But then I was like, actually, the mindset there is spot on. Because it's absolute determination. It's absolute dedication. Uh, it's unflinching commitment. It says, also, thank you to one yoga teacher. Um, and of course, you too, Bhante. Wink. <laughs> yeah, I saw you guys up there doing your stretching thing. That was cute. <laughs> <laughs> Probably when I'm older, I'll do more stretching. But right now, I don't do much. Can you explain the difference between mindfulness of the body focused on the hands and perception of impermanence focused on the hands? Sounds like the Vipassana meditation should contain thoughts or techniques I'm missing out on. Actually, no. Uh, there's no thoughts uh, relevant here. Um, I wrote a detailed article about the perception of impermanence, which hopefully will be up on the website yeah, sometime yeah. relatively soon. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is that mindfulness of the body focused on the hands you're using the apparent solidity of the hands, the apparent solidity of the body, to help focus the mind. 
So you're actually using the perception of stability, the perception of solidity, the perception of permanence, which is, is delusion, of course, but it's our ordinary mind state. So we're using it to our benefit to establish concentration, to establish mindfulness. So like right now, um, unless you've been practicing perception of impermanence with serious dedication, right now your body probably feels solid. Does anybody here, does their body feel solid right now? Okay, uh, most people aren't paying attention, that's fine. <laughs> um, so then your hands feel solid. So we're using that apparent solidity of like, there seems to be a solid object here, my hands. So I'll focus my attention on that solid object that seems to be there. So this gives us a, a solid anchor, seemingly solid anchor for our attention. So that's using it for concentration. But when we, when we switch to doing the perception of impermanence, our attention is in the same area, but we're no longer focusing on a solid object. Instead, we're watching the constant change of everything within that domain, everything within that area. And as the practice becomes more refined, so constant change implies watching things over time, but as the practice becomes more refined, then we recognize that the, uh, it's not a single object changing over time, but rather it's a series of moments of sensation. So it's not that you have a hand and the hand exists over a period of time, it's just that it's a little bit different over time. Um, that's not the experience. This, the experience then becomes to a series of moments in which there is the experience of a hand. And in each moment, that experience is different. So at this layer, we're focusing on that experience of moments of sensation. And as we pay closer attention, what we'll notice is that each moment simultaneously arises and ceases. It simultaneously comes into being and ceases to exist. So then what we recognize is that the, experience, like the, the object is only, you might say, half real, or partially real. It takes on a ghostly quality, a mirage-like quality, an illusory quality, like with the similes we, we were looking at earlier, like a, like a lump of foam, like a mirage, like a, an illusion. It takes on that quality to where our experience of our body becomes not either of a solid object or of nothingness, but of something in between. It's not really here, but there's clearly something here. That's what the experience becomes. It's, it's at this ghostly quality, this ghostly point between existence and non-existence. So, uh, and again, this is right in the present moment. It doesn't take place over time. It doesn't require any thought. It's an immediate, present moment experience. Okay? <laughs> Did that clear up the missing points? Um, read the article. It should be out in the next few weeks. Um, I go into a lot more detail in the article. Um, the term absorption was used in a question yesterday. Can you define this? Uh, I don't use the word absorption, actually. Uh, I don't use it because it tends to bring up a connotation which I think is not useful. Uh, so there's uh, absorption. When I've heard the word absorption used, it usually implies ignoring everything else. I'm like, I was so absorbed in my book that I didn't hear the car go by. Um, and we don't want to be cultivating ignorance. We don't want to be cultivating mindlessness. We don't want to be cultivating a lack of awareness. So the encouragement I usually make is when doing concentration meditation, you put 80% of your attention on the object and you keep it there. So the center of your, of your awareness is always on the object but you leave about 20% for peripheral awareness. So you're not blacking out everything else. You're still aware of everything else, you're just not looking at it. 
It's like right now, I'm, I'm just looking at this piece of paper, but I am peripherally, I'm aware of the water bottle and the bell and uh, the window and so on. But my gaze doesn't move from uh, the paper. That's what, uh, that's the kind of attitude in meditation practice that's, that uh, is most useful because we're leaving, we're leaving the field open so that when we start doing insight meditation, the field is already there. Um, there's other reasons as well. If we develop a, a blanking out mentality, then that can lead us to blanking out entirely uh, and just zoning out or going to sleep or uh, switching off, which is not useful. Um, so I, uh, I know several people who had this problem. They thought that concentration practice meant blacking out everything other than your object. And then they started having serious problems with falling asleep during meditation. And I was like, well, of course you're falling asleep. You're training yourself to black out. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. You're not training your mind to concentrate. Mm -hmm. You're training your mind to black out. So we don't want to train the mind to black out. That's not helpful. So keeping a little bit of peripheral awareness, but your attention focused entirely on the object. No, 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 no. We can talk after the retreat tomorrow. So hold your question for now. No, no, hold it for now. <laughs> you can write it down if you need to. It says, I use the second formless attainment as my object of meditation. Okay, that worries me right off the bat, but let's see where this goes. I can access it off the cushion very easily. See, second formless attainment, uh, infinite consciousness. Have you heard of anyone using the first or second formless attainment for insight or mindfulness, using as a subtle focus and background to keep awareness? I also go more into focus to get into samadhi There's a word here that I can't read. Meditation, oh, jhana. Samadhi slash jhana meditation with the form of attainment. That is if I am not deluded. Yeah, I think, I think you're getting ahead of yourself. Um, yeah, I would not recommend using infinite consciousness as a meditation object at this point. Yeah, that's getting, getting way ahead of yourself. Prior to deep concentration, uh, the first and second uh, formless objects um, being space and consciousness are used, space and consciousness are used as parts of the elements meditation. So the fifth and sixth elements respectively are space and consciousness. So we use them as uh, a form of, uh, of insight meditation primarily, as a way of, of developing the perception of not self. Um, but I wouldn't recommend particularly using them as uh, mindfulness or concentration objects. Yeah, I would highly recommend using your body instead. Um, come and talk to me after the retreat. Talk to me in person. Uh, and Yeah, I need more information to make a really clear statement. But for the time being, this, yeah, this worries me a bit. I wouldn't recommend this approach. I would not recommend using infinite consciousness as your object. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> it says, I hear things more clearly and see things more clearly since I'm here. What is it from? Is it good or bad? That's good. That's called mindfulness and clear awareness. Um, it's something that we're actively trying to develop in our practice. So it's a good thing. It's a good sign. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So that's it for questions.